compass of lost souls. The last rays of sunlight speared through the dense canopy, dappling the forest floor where Cynthia, Ben, Maya and Michael trudged along the barely there trail. Their weekend backpacking trip, originally a celebration of Cynthia finally landing a promotion, had taken a detour when they'd missed a turn. Now lost and with dusk rapidly approaching, panic gnawed at the edges of their exhaustion. There! Michael, the youngest of the group, pointed excitedly, his voice echoing in the stillness. See that light filtering through the trees? Maybe it's a ranger station or something. Hope surged through Cynthia. She pushed through a curtain of ferns, the others scrambling behind her. A small, ramshackle cabin emerged from the encroaching darkness. Smoke curled from a chimney, a beacon in the gathering gloom. Relief warred with a flicker of unease. The cabin looked deserted, almost forgotten. Carved symbols, intricate and unsettling, adorned the rotting door. Ignoring the oddity, Cynthia reached for the rusted handle. It creaked open without resistance. Inside, dust motes danced in the feeble light from a single flickering lantern. Cobwebs draped the corners, and the air hung thick with the smell of damp wood and something... older. A sense of wrongness prickled at Cynthia's skin. Maybe we should just yell out, Maya suggested, her voice tight. See if anyone's home? Maybe later, Ben said, already exploring. Let's just see if we can find a dry place to spend the night. They found a cluttered room with a large, dusty fireplace in the back. Unfurling their sleeping bags on the creaking floorboards, they huddled close for warmth. The strangeness of the cabin pressing down on them. As darkness claimed the outside world, the whispers began. Faint at first, like the sigh of the wind, they seemed to seep through the walls. The whispers grew bolder, weaving a chilling narrative in an unknown language. Terror clawed at Cynthia's throat. Did you guys hear that? Ben, ever the pragmatist, scoffed. Just the wind playing tricks. But then came the footsteps. Heavy and deliberate, they circled the cabin, drawing closer. The friends exchanged panicked glances. Cynthia fumbled for her phone, but there was no signal. Suddenly, the cabin door slammed open with a bang that rattled the windows. A tall, gaunt figure, shrouded in a tattered black cloak, stood framed in the doorway. Moonlight cast long, grotesque shadows on the wall. A collective gasp escaped their lips. Cynthia scrambled for a fallen branch by the fireplace, her heart pounding a frantic rhythm against her ribs. The figure spoke, his voice a guttural rasp. Lost, are you? None of them dared to breathe. Don't worry, the figure continued, taking a halting step forward. There's room for more here. That's when Maya, ever the quick thinker, pointed to the dying fire. You look cold, she said, her voice surprisingly steady. Why don't you come in and warm yourself by the fire? The figure hesitated, then shuffled towards the fireplace, his face hidden in the shadows of his hood. As he moved closer, the whispers rose to a crescendo, then abruptly fell silent. The oppressive feeling, the sense of something inherently wrong, lifted like a fog. Cynthia noticed the way the figure moved, stiff and jerky, almost inhuman. Her grip on the branch tightened. The figure stretched his gaunt hands towards the fire, the cloak billowing around him. In that moment, the lantern's flickering flame illuminated his face. It was a face both ancient and youthful, etched with a lifetime of experiences yet smooth as a child's. The eyes, however, were the most startling feature. They were two bottomless pits, black and devoid of any light. Ben, his voice regaining its edge, spoke up. Who are you? The figure tilted his head, seemingly surprised by the question. Who are you? He echoed in a voice that sounded young and oddly lost. The way he spoke, his confusion disarmed them. Cynthia lowered the branch cautiously. We're hikers, she said. Lost on our way back. Can you help us? Lost, he repeated, as if the word held some significance for him. Yes, I understand lost. He spent the rest of the night by the fire, warming himself. He spoke little, mostly incoherent mumbles about being trapped, about waiting... They learned his name was Silas. As dawn approached, casting a pale light through the grimy windows, Silas turned to them. Thank you, he said, his voice raspy. 
for the company, for the warmth. He pointed towards a hidden cupboard beside the fireplace. There's a map, Silas finished, his voice dropping to a low whisper. It might help you find your way back. Hesitantly, Cynthia approached the cupboard. Dust swirled as she creaked it open, revealing a rolled-up piece of parchment tied with a faded red ribbon. Unfurling it, she saw a crudely drawn map of the forest, their current location marked with a crude X, but the most bizarre feature was a series of winding paths leading from the cabin, none leading out of the woods. They simply circled back, ending in dead ends marked with what looked like shack symbols. This doesn't seem right, Michael pointed out, peering over Cynthia's shoulder. There's no exit. Silas, his gaze fixed on the map, spoke almost to himself. The paths are wrong. They've been corrupted. A flicker of unease ran through Cynthia. Corrupted by what? Silas raised a shaky finger, pointing at the intricate symbols carved on the cabin walls. These. They used to be a guide, a way to navigate the woods. Now, they're a trap. Suddenly, a chilling realisation dawned on Cynthia. The whispers, the footsteps. It wasn't something coming for them. It was them. Or rather, the echoes of past lost souls trapped by the corrupted symbols. You're not the guardian of this place, are you? she asked, dread creeping into her voice. Silas's head snapped towards her, his empty eyes boring into hers. No, he rasped. I'm one of the lost. The weight of his words hung heavy in the air. Cynthia understood then. The cabin wasn't a haven, it was a prison. The whispers were echoes of those who came before them, lured by a false sense of security, trapped by the twisted symbols. Can they be undone? Maya asked, her voice trembling slightly. Silas shook his head, despair etched on his face. Not without the key. It was stolen, lost with the one who corrupted the symbols. A glimmer of hope flickered in Cynthia's mind. The key? Can you tell us what it looked like? Silas closed his eyes, concentrating. When they opened again, a flicker of recognition sparked within them. A silver compass, etched with the same symbols as these walls. Cynthia's heart leaped. Back in her backpack, nestled amongst her hiking gear, was her grandfather's old compass. He'd claimed it brought him luck on his countless wilderness adventures. It was silver, and upon closer inspection, she saw the faint etchings that mirrored the symbols in the cabin. With trembling hands, she pulled out the compass. As she held it towards Silas, a soft golden light emanated from it bathing the carvings on the walls in a warm glow. The whispers started again, a low hum that built in intensity. The symbols themselves writhed and shifted, the lines rearranging until they finally settled into a new configuration. The oppressive feeling in the cabin vanished, replaced by a sense of peace. Silas let out a shaky breath, a single tear rolling down his gaunt cheek. Finally, he rasped his voice regaining its strength. After so long, he turned to them, gratitude shining in his eyes. With the symbols corrected, the way out should be clear. But be warned, the woods still hold dangers. Stick to the paths, and you will find your way back. With newfound hope, they packed their things, their fear replaced by a sense of awe. As they stepped out of the cabin, sunlight filtered through the trees, casting the forest in a warm, inviting glow. The path ahead, barely visible before, was now clear and easy to follow. Looking back at the cabin, they saw Silas standing in the doorway, watching them leave. A small, sad smile played on his lips. He raised a hand in farewell, then turned and vanished back inside. The journey out of the woods was long and arduous, but they navigated easily, following the now clear path. As they finally emerged back onto the familiar trail, exhaustion mingled with a sense of accomplishment. They knew they wouldn't forget Silas or the terrifying yet strangely beautiful experience in the abandoned cabin. They had stumbled upon a hidden secret, a testament to the power of both trust and deception. And as they emerged back into civilization, they carried with them not just the story of their lost weekend, but a reminder of the unseen forces that sometimes lurk in the heart of nature. The Doll Under the Floorboards the Peterson family piled out of the moving truck, blinking at the afternoon sun glinting off the peeling paint of their new Victorian home. 
Ten-year-old Lily, ever the explorer, was already tugging at her dad's hand, eager to investigate the dusty attic. Careful, sweetheart, her mother Elizabeth cautioned, eyeing the cobwebs hanging from the porch rafters. Inside, the air hung thick with the scent of neglect, but with a bit of elbow grease, Elizabeth saw potential. The first few weeks were idyllic. Lily revelled in the creaky floorboards and hidden nooks, while Elizabeth threw herself into renovations. However, subtle oddities began to appear. Elizabeth found misplaced toys, doors creaking open on their own and whispers in the dead of night. One evening, as John, Elizabeth's husband, settled into reading a book by the fireplace, a chilling laugh, high-pitched and childlike, echoed through the room. John spun around, heart hammering against his ribs. Lily? he called out, voice cracking. Silence. Lily, ever the pragmatist, dismissed these occurrences as the house settling. Elizabeth, however, felt a knot of fear tightening in her gut. One night, while tucking Lily into bed, Elizabeth noticed a scribbled message on the antique wardrobe mirror. Go away. Sleep became a luxury. The whispers intensified, morphing into pleas and choked sobs. Unexplained cold spots hung heavy in the air, and Lily swore she saw a fleeting shadow flitting down the hallway. Desperation clawed at Elizabeth. She confided in John, who, while unnerved, remained unconvinced. Maybe it's just old pipes, he offered, more for his own comfort than hers. One afternoon, Elizabeth sat in the now-furnished attic, a box of old photographs in her lap. A faded picture slipped out, depicting a young girl with long, dark hair and a familiar sadness in her eyes. Elizabeth gasped. The face in the photograph mirrored the fleeting shadow Lily had seen. Suddenly, a gust of icy wind swept through the room, the windows rattling in their frames. A mournful cry, louder and closer than before, resonated through the house. Elizabeth whipped around, heart pounding. A child's form materialised across the room, a wisp of translucent light, with the same sorrowful eyes from the photograph. Who are you? Elizabeth whispered, voice trembling. The ghostly figure floated toward her, a voice barely a whimper. My name is Emily. I lived here. Once. Elizabeth felt a wave of empathy crash over her fear. What happened to you, Emily? She asked gently. Another gust of wind, colder this time, filled the room. The image of Emily flickered, distorted. Elizabeth could just make out a shadowed figure looming behind her, rage contorting its features. Suddenly, the room plunged into darkness. Elizabeth scrambled to her feet, adrenaline coursing through her veins. John! Lily! She screamed into the void. Light flickered on, revealing John rushing through the attic door, concern creasing his face. Elizabeth threw herself into his arms, her voice thick with terror. It's real, John, the ghost. It's a little girl, her name is Emily. John's scepticism finally crumbled in the face of Elizabeth's raw fear. They found Lily huddled under her bed, whimpering. That night, the family huddled together on the living room floor, sleep an impossibility. Driven by desperation, Elizabeth researched the house's history. She discovered that a young girl named Emily had died in a fire decades ago, trapped upstairs. The news articles mentioned a cruel stepmother. Armed with this knowledge, Elizabeth returned to the attic. Emily, she called out, her voice echoing in the dusty space. We want to help you. Can you tell us what happened? A choked sob filled the room. The apparition of Emily materialised in front of Elizabeth, her face contorted in a silent scream. Elizabeth saw not a vengeful spirit, but a child burdened by a terrible injustice. My stepmother, Emily rasped, voice barely audible, locked me in my room. The fire. I couldn't get out. The pieces clicked into place for Elizabeth. The whispers of hate, the escalation of aggression. It wasn't Emily lashing out. It was the ghost of her tormentor, trapped with her. Days went weeks as Elizabeth dug further into local records. Finally, she unearthed a faded will, revealing that Emily's stepmother had inherited everything. It was clear the stepmother had locked Emily away to secure the inheritance. Elizabeth knew what they had to do. With John's help, she contacted a paranormal investigator, a woman named Ms Edwards, known for her calm approach to ghost hunting. Ms Edwards arrived, 
a no-nonsense woman with a kind smile and a worn leather tool belt. She spent hours examining the house, taking EMF readings and setting up EVP recorders. As dusk settled, she gathered the family in the living room. There are two spirits here, she explained, her voice grave. The young girl, Emily, seems confused and lost. But there's another presence, filled with anger and malice. That's likely the stepmother. A shiver ran down Elizabeth's spine. Ms Edwards suggested a ritual to help Emily find peace, a process that would involve Elizabeth channelling Emily's emotions. Elizabeth, fuelled by a desire to help the young girl, readily agreed. That night, the house grew eerily still. Ms Edwards guided Elizabeth through a meditation, leading her to connect with Emily's spirit. Images flooded Elizabeth's mind, a terrified child, flames licking at the door, the chilling laughter of a cruel woman. Elizabeth let out a choked sob, feeling Emily's terror as if it were her own. Suddenly, a cold wind swept through the room, the temperature dropping sharply. A dark, shadowy figure materialised in the corner, its rage a palpable presence. Elizabeth squeezed her eyes shut, tears streaming down her face. Emily. Elizabeth called out, her voice wavering but strong. You don't have to be here anymore. Your stepmother can't hurt you. It's time to find peace. A wave of sadness washed over Elizabeth, followed by a faint flicker of light. The image of Emily, no longer a wisp of despair, stood beside Elizabeth, bathed in a gentle luminescence. She looked at Elizabeth, a flicker of gratitude passing through her spectral eyes. Then, with a soft sigh, Emily's form dissolved into a shower of sparkling light particles that drifted towards the attic window. The cold vanished, replaced by a warm breeze that carried the faint scent of lavender, Emily's favourite according to the old letters Elizabeth had found. The oppressive silence was broken by Ms Edwards, a relieved smile on her face. She's gone, she said softly. She's at peace now. The following days were the first truly peaceful ones the family had experienced in the house. The whispers and cold spots ceased. Though a bittersweet ache lingered for Emily, a sense of calm had settled over the home. One morning, Lily skipped into the kitchen, a bright smile on her face. Mommy, she announced, holding up a faded doll. Look what I found under the floorboards in my room. It smells like flowers. The doll, a porcelain figure with long dark hair, was identical to one in the old photograph Elizabeth had seen. Tears welled up in Elizabeth's eyes. It was a sign, a final goodbye from a little girl finally free. The Peterson family had not only found a new home, but also helped a restless spirit find solace. Theirs may have been a haunted house, but in the end, it became a place of healing for both the living and the dead. Planchette's malice. The air crackled with nervous energy as Elizabeth placed her trembling fingertips on the planchette. The flickering candlelight cast grotesque shadows on the basement walls, where dusty VHS tapes and mouldy board games sat like silent observers. The other four teens, huddled around the Ouija board, mirrored Elizabeth's apprehension. This wasn't supposed to be serious. It was all a dare, a stupid high school prank fueled by boredom and bravado. Okay, guys, stammered Ben, the self-proclaimed leader of the group. Is there anyone out there who wants to contact us? The silence in the basement was broken only by the creak of the old furnace and the frantic thumping of their hearts. Minutes bled into what felt like hours. Disappointment tinged with relief began to settle in. Maybe this is all a crock, whispered Emily, the sceptic of the group. Just as she spoke, the planchette twitched, then lurched decisively towards the letter Y. A collective gasp escaped their lips. Is someone there? Ben's voice, usually booming with confidence, was now a mere squeak. The planchette continued its erratic dance, spelling out a chilling message. H-E-L-L-O. A cold wind seemed to sweep through the basement, extinguishing the lone candle and plunging them into darkness. Panic surged. Shrieks and flailing limbs filled the air as they scrambled for the flickering emergency exit sign. The following days were a blur of paranoia and unease. Elizabeth, once the life of the party, became withdrawn and sullen. Ben, known for his athletic prowess, developed a debilitating stutter. Emily's once vibrant eyes were now hollowed and haunted. 
One by one, they started experiencing disturbing visions. Elizabeth dreamt of a skeletal figure with glowing red eyes, beckoning her closer. Ben saw his reflection morph into a grotesque caricature of himself, his laughter echoing with malice. Emily witnessed the basement walls oozing a black, viscous liquid that whispered her deepest fears. Terror finally boiled over during lunch break at school. Elizabeth started screaming, clawing at her throat as if something was choking her. Ben's stutter escalated into a torrent of nonsensical gibberish. Emily, her eyes wide with terror, began speaking in a voice that wasn't her own, a deep, gravelly rasp that sent shivers down everyone's spine. The school nurse ushered them into the principal's office, bewildered and terrified. Their disjointed explanations, punctuated by Elizabeth's choked sobs and Ben's incoherent ramblings, were met with a sceptical frown from the principal. This sounds more like a case of mass hysteria than demonic possession, he said, his voice laced with disapproval. Desperate and ostracised, the teenagers turned to Elizabeth's grandmother, a kind-eyed woman with a knowing smile. Elizabeth's grandma, a practitioner of folk remedies, listened patiently to their harrowing tale. Her eyes clouded over with concern. You've tampered with forces you don't understand, children, she said gently. But there's still hope. We can try to cleanse you. The following days were gruelling. Elizabeth's grandma subjected them to a series of rituals that involved chanting, burning herbs and sprinkling the room with holy water. The entity fought back, manifesting as grotesque apparitions and ear-splitting shrieks. But Elizabeth's grandma persevered, her unwavering faith a beacon in the darkness. Finally, on the seventh day, a particularly violent struggle ensued. The room pulsed with an unnatural energy. Elizabeth's grandma, her face etched with determination, chanted a final incantation. The air crackled and a blood-curdling shriek tore through the house. Then silence. Exhausted but relieved, they collapsed onto the floor. The entity was gone. The basement, once a place of dread, no longer felt oppressive. A sense of peace, hard-won and fragile, settled over them. The ordeal left an indelible mark. Their friendship, once carefree, was now forged in shared trauma. They vowed never to speak of the Ouija board incident again. But the memory lingered, a chilling reminder of the night they unwittingly opened a door to a darkness they could barely comprehend. Thanks for watching. To support us, please like and subscribe.